Welcome to the UK OCR Community Podcast, presented by Obstacle Racing Media. Each episode, we'll be talking to race directors, elite runners, weekend warriors, and frankly, anyone else from the UK OCR scene that will talk to us. Here is your host, Alan, aka Muddy Duck. Anywhere in Chicken Town. The bloody scene is bloody sad. The bloody news is bloody bad. Greetings, friends, acquaintances, and anyone else who just happens to be listening. Welcome to another edition of the UK OCR podcast. For me, it's a Saturday morning. For you, it's a Monday or a year. It could be any other day of the week. I don't I don't really know. Um, hope you're all doing well. Hope you all had a great weekend. Uh, did you see the post that I put out on Friday night about the Innovates? £45 for some 212s. If you didn't, go and have a look. They might be all sold out now, but go and have a look absolute bargain and i've got lots of messages saying thank you for posting and a lot of people have purchased them um, i don't get no commission good to wish i would have what have you been up to anyway um i have not only bought some innovates but i have bought a new car yes i bought a new car so you'll see me at events in my new bmw um going forward after quite a long minute Maybe because I'm getting a bonus at work. At work, I'm getting a bonus. Anyway, let's get back onto um, OCR and this week. This week, we have got Morgan Maxwell. Now, if you don't know Morgan, Morgan as I want to say, one of the probably first babies of OCR, as in he got into OCR younger and now he's into the Elite um, series. So, yeah, he's been brought up for eight years on, on OCR. And we'll talk a little bit about that, how he got into it, how his parents got him into it. Um, and what he's doing now and where he is and what his aspirations are. And we get a little bit behind the scenes behind him. So let's fire away, me and Morgan. Morgan Maxwell, welcome to the UK OCR podcast. How's tricks? Yes, good. Yeah, good. How about you? Um, I'm all I'm all good. I'm all good, thank you. Um, I have just, I've just, I'm going to just finish work. And, it, and as I was walking home, I actually got something. And I thought, this could be our first topic. Because I listened to Accountability Corner. And I listened to the first episode, and I know you like your chocolate bars. Yes, I do and like so my chocolate bars. <laughs> What's your favourite? Oh, uh, well, that's, that's a tough question, that, actually. That's, I do like a Kit Kat. I'm, I'm a bit, especially the Kit Kat Chunkies and the Kit Kat Chunky peanut butter ones. They're like my go-to. But a Whisper, that's like my little, my, my treat, if you like. I won't get it that often, but I do like a Whisper as well. It just melts in your mouth a whisper, doesn't it? It's yeah. like it's like heaven. Do you find though, once you've had a whisper, I'm forever licking my teeth because it's like melted between my teeth and in my gums, and I'm like I'm forever like licking and trying to get get you that little bit extra that's just saved itself in the corner. Uh, yeah, it just gets every yeah, that, and that's why it's like a one time. You'll have it occasionally, but you can't have that all the time. So like, but go to Kit Kat, you know, it's just trusted. It's quick and easy. You have got the wafer, and it's not as yeah. messy. But yeah. Do you take them on runs with you? So I take I like star bars. Star bars are my favourite. I've always loved a star bar. I think it used to be called something else before star bars, but um they've always been my favourite. And I tend to take them when I go on long runs. So I'll I'll chuck two in my pack. Rather than take like Voom or some special nutrition, mm. I just want to sometimes just grab a bit of chocolate, a bit of chewiness in me, a um, bit of peanut and that. Do you take anything on long runs like that? Or? Uh, I've taken a Snickers bar before. Yeah. I'm partial to a Snickers bar, but not. I uh, I struggle to digest too much when I run, so I prefer like gels and things I can just get down me quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, apart from so like when I did four laps of nuts, that was all Snickers bars the whole time, just running around with Snickers bars. <laughs> How did you have time to eat? I mean, I've, I've that's on my notes four laps of nuts, but three and a half hours. I mean, that's that's crazy. Twenty eight k. People could, yeah, you can run it in three and a half hours, but we're talking about nuts here. We're talking about knee deep, mud in places, all the obstacles. You know, I mean, that's a crazy time. What was, uh, without looking back, do you know what um, Connor and um, John Alban did it in when they did the four laps back in the day? I, I, did, I did look at it at the time, and I think Connor's was just a bit, I want to say quicker, but there weren't much in it. But obviously, the course was very different. Um, but I think he was just quicker than me. Um, I don't. I'm not sure on John albums, but I think well, Connor's I, got the record. So yeah. Connor's would have been. I think I would have beat John um, off of memory, but I think Connor's was just a bit out of reach. Wow, wow! Imagine if you could have a career like John. 
that's going to be a dream. Yeah, yeah that, that is the dream. Yeah. <laughs> you've started a bit younger than him, though. Am yeah, I right true. in saying that? Yeah, you've, yeah, yeah. You've been yeah. there, started a bit younger than that. When did you get into OCR? So 14 years old. So I was 14 when I started. I'm 22 now. So oh, Wow, few, you're a little kid. Ago. You've been around for that long, you know. We forget that you're still only 20. Well, I forget that you're still only 22 when I see your, your name coming up. How, how did you get into it? I know how you got into it. Because I've, like I said, I listen to your podcast as well. But um, maybe not all my listeners know how you got into it. How did you get into it? Uh, so it started with Dave Peters, really, at Rumble Fitness. Um, so he was PTing out of a gym. And my mum went to that gym. And then she started going to his classes. And then she, he basically ran like a boot camp. But it was for getting people into, like, through Nuts Challenge, essentially. Yeah. That was like the first thing they were doing. Um, so she joined that. And then she got, she did nuts and she did the kind of all them sort of races back in the day, uh, all like the proper old school ones. Uh, and then, yeah, the, she kind of thought, well, Morgan would be pretty good at this. So let's get him along, get him to try it. And then that was a start, really. I was obsessed ever since. As soon as I got on like my first rig or did my first race, it was like, right, this is something I can get into this. Did you, were you into sport at school? So when you got into this at 14, before that, was you into any sport, you know, team sports, individual sports? Yeah, so I've done, I've always been sporty. So I've done loads of sports. So I've football, obviously from England, that's kind of the first sport, that and rugby is you either go yeah. one or the other way. Uh, so football I played when I was younger, uh, but for big one for me was basketball. So I played basketball pretty much most of my kind of young teens until about 15. Um so yeah, basket, and I got to quite a decent level as well. But I mean, it's basketball's a bit weird because there's not that many people playing it in this country. It's quite easy to get up the ranks quite quickly. Yeah. Uh, so I played for, I played in the national league. So when I was younger, we were traveling around playing basketball and things. Um, but then I just never grew. So it's kind of like I'm not tall enough for this. <laughs> <laughs> so I need to find something else that I can get at. You reached a certain height, and then ding, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was about it was about 15 years old, and everyone just seemed to be having these growth spurts and I just didn't have mine yet. And I was, it went, we went from playing, playing people with similar sizes to me and then we went up like a year group and now I'm playing like 15 year olds that are already six foot three. And it's just, you just, I was five foot five at the time and I couldn't do anything. It was like, yeah, just getting blocked and thrown on the floor every second. And yeah, it was uh, fun. <laughs> I've got visions of you like going for the basket and you know jumping up and the other guys just still stood still, just like putting their hands up and stopping taps you. And, it. Yeah, just taps it out of the way. Yeah. So that that was pretty that was pretty much it. I mean, I, I actually I became a better basketball player because of it, because I had to change the whole way I played. But it got to a point where we also my team merged with another team and the coach was our our team's coach and she was not playing our team at all really so then that was another reason it was kind of like okay we need to start looking at doing another sport or stopping this but um basketball's but yeah. lost ocr game that's how i see yeah. that yeah, yeah they've lost you we, we've gained you <laughs> <laughs> so when you you know was it was not your first ever event then that you went down to oh uh no so my first ever race was a junior race and it was it was the iron run i believe that's what it was called in um, corby if I remember right, look, Kettering yeah. Corbin Middles, you're 14, yeah. you wouldn't have known where this <laughs> one was, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, some, it was, I remember being in the car for a couple of hours, but um, yeah. yeah, so that was like the first one and that was just, my parents were doing it, but it was the first kind of junior race we'd seen. Um, so they thought, oh, that'd be great, a good one to start off with a junior race. Um, and yeah, that was my first ever one. I think I came... I could see actually the certificate there. So that was second in that one, and then I did it the year later, and I won it. Um, oh, wow! But yeah. how, how long was that course? Because I I've, I did Iron Man several times. A great course um, for anyone who's never done it. It was around a quarry. Went around a quarry. Lots of water involved in it. But I think there was a swim in a really deep lake. But it wasn't a long swim for adults. I think it was only about twenty meters. But it was really deep lake. Um, and then you came out and you went on, under. Like a crawl on it was the first time they'd ever done this in the UK was a crawl on your back with a net above you and you pulled yourself on the net. That was the first time that was ever done in the UK. You had lots of walls, I remember. Um, what was it like as a junior? Do you remember what it was like back then? Um, there was lots of walls. We I don't think we did too much water. It was definitely a short a shorter course. Um 
I remember it being quite run heavy because that was my first experience of like quite long distance running as well that wasn't training. So yeah. I remember when I finished, I was like, that was a lot of running. Um, but yeah, there was just a lot of, from memory, there was a lot of walls and vaults and kind of natural terrain obstacles. Um, I think there might have been a spider as well, but, but I mean, again, I was, I don't remember too much of it. <laughs> <laughs> it just feels, it does feel a bit strange to me because I'm like, I, I've got a, a son that's, um, just a little bit younger than you, um, and you know he, he's done OCRs and things like. That. And I said to him, "Do you remember when you did um, OCR down at Tuckman?" No, I don't remember that one. And it's like, you know, why don't you remember these things? And it's because you're so young still. That's why you don't remember them. But um, it just it feels funny for me uh, in that respect. I see a lot of my son in you. Um, so we did that, and when when did it become competitive for you? So at fourteen, there wasn't really any real major competitiveness back then you know i mean we're going back um eight years back then for youth there was only i remember ram run being competitive in about 2018 2019 um not long before it finished for the juniors but there wasn't very much competitive junior races apart from military mud run um and that yeah so that's so military mud run and um it was one of my first kind of also the iron run um, they were like the first junior races, but mm-hmm. then it was just, I was basically getting into whatever adult race I could and just comparing times with the top 10 or whatever it was, or comparing times with like, sometimes you could see your age group to just see where I was in my age group. But a lot of races, especially in the beginning when I was that young, uh, we had to ask for permission to get into them. So there'd be some adults races where after about a year of me doing quite a few races, we'd then go to him and say, look, I've done this race, done this race, done this race. Is there any chance? I know you're 16 and plus, but can Morgan do it? And yeah. most of the time they'd let me in and race. So, yeah. I think back then it was very much in its early stages. It, you know, it was it was like sort of wave two. I, I always call it wave two in 20, you know, 2017, 2018. Um, and you got a lot of race directors that just wanted people to have fun and come along. And I, I know there were, it was very easy to talk to race directors back then. Um, where prior to that, it was the race directors sat up a bit on a pedestal. You know, you tried to talk to them and they didn't want to talk to you. Um, so you came right at the right time. Um, and Libby Joyce has, has benefited from that, you know, as well, because people, uh, mum can go to events and say, hey, you know, Libby's 15, can she come and race? And the race directors now are very accommodating and that. Which, which was your first one that you did that you think you shouldn't have done then? Uh, I think Nuts, I'm right. pretty sure, let me do it quite early on because Dave's got a really good relationship with Wayne. Um, yeah. But I'd only do like one one lap before they started. And then they started doing junior races. So I'd start doing their kind of junior races. Um, I did a lot of Ram runs, but I don't know what the age limit was on that. So I don't know if they let me in or whether... Did I you do the full do Ram it. run where you did the Bridge of Despair and... Yeah. Um, that's oh, like yeah. my favorite race. That is, yeah, that's so I did. I've done quite a f- pretty much every year since I started doing OCR. We did Ram Runs because yeah. um, it was also my parents' favorite race. Uh, so, me, my dad, and Andy, who was like also my age at the time, we used to always go to Ram Run and do that. And that was like, yeah, that was always the best races. I, I couldn't agree more. It was always my favorite when because you had the Bridge of Despair where you had the swim. So, you swam yeah. and then you got to the bridge where you went to, you had a choice of rope. Cargo or cargo net, um, and then he, he put in. Did you do it when they had the the bridge of hope when you jumped off? Um, yeah, 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 about four meters into into the river. I mean that that was amazing. I mean Ian Exeter who did that for me, absolutely fantastic. What he did with Ram Run, um, pity that it moved and then sort of stopped happening. And as an OCR, yeah, and, and that because um, it was absolutely amazing. I could talk about Ram Run all day. Me and Ian, <laughs> we were we were best buddies. Um, did you do the w- winter one? when he made everyone do the cage crawl and it was absolutely freezing. That might have been, you might have been a bit too young for that one. But I'm yeah, not sure. I, don't, I don't think I remember that one. Um, no, probably not. Because they, they were the first ones as well that really started with the rigs. I don't know if you remember when yeah. they put the rigs at the back and they had six or seven lanes of rigs and, um, you know, they, they did the rings, they did the the cargo nets, the ropes, they, they did everything. Um, and that was the, I guess that was the, the first stages of rings and that. Now I know, and I've got on my notes here that you did the British Championships. Now I'm gonna have to get this right here. Um, when we had the rig where no one could do, 
So I want to talk to you about, about that, which was down in Pippingford. How did you get on there? That that to be that race was one of my biggest kind of learning races, um, to be honest, because I raced really hard as I, as I could at that age. Um, and there was a few guys around my age and we all kind of knew each other because there wasn't many of us. So we all knew who each other was and we were doing the same races every weekend. Um, so it was actually that was probably my first experience of a real competitive race. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I fell off the ninja rings, which that had fallen off that early on because that was quite near the start of the race kind of changed the race a lot and then I got to that last rig and it was the that rig was the most annoying thing because I literally got to the last ring so I'd pretty much done the whole rig yeah I just missed the bell and Dave Peters was next to me um and he hit the bell he was one of the few people to do it and obviously because he was my coach at the time it was like right I really want to beat him on this rig or really want to get it or he want to hit the bell um but yeah got all the way to the end just missed the bell and then I looked back and I saw the queue of retries and I was, I thought, oh, not today. So I just ran to the finish. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I don't want to go through that again. That that retry lane was crazy, wasn't it? I mean, it was, it was so long. I think at one stage, I think it was over 120 people. I counted um, just waiting for, to have another go. It was, it was the worst. It was, it was probably the toughest rig I've ever seen. Um, but the worst retry lane, you know, was, they had to do something about that and people yeah. was coming down with hypothermia and things like that. Well, that was the now, thing. It was so cold as well, that that whole race, especially because I was yeah. like, I must have been 16. So, and I was still quite a slim, not much meat on me, shall we say, not much insulation. So I was <laughs> I was getting quite cold. Um, so, yeah, as soon as I looked back at that retry lane, I was like, there's no way I'm waiting and, and starting to shiver. And I was like, yeah, no, I'll just finish. Yeah. Absolutely crazy. That, that was 2016, 2017. You did Rumble Fitness um, and you broke the record by doing 107 rigs. Is that right? Oh, uh, that was the ring challenge. Yeah. yeah. So we so we did it basically just up and down the rings. Um, and Dave was always with challenges at Rumble, especially when I was younger, because I was I was not very mature, but also very competitive. So I always just wanted to win. But, but that challenge, he was like, right, don't don't win straight away start nice and easy and we'll just build up and everyone can have a go and progress and progress. And it got to the point, I think it was Linda Johnson. She was winning. And then one day I just thought, right, I need to just win this thing now. So I just went on the rings. I just kept going. Um, but where I was a lot lighter as well, I could literally just keep going on the rings for days. Um, and yeah, 107. I'm actually going to share the video. I'm going to share the video when we put this podcast out because you look so young there as well. <laughs> yeah, I was a lot different in build and everything. Yeah, um, massively. Did, at Rumble Fitness, they've got some of the best racers there. You know, you've got yourself on there, but not just yourself. They have got so many high quality people who go to train there, even if they don't actually race for Rumble. What was it like, you know, as a as a teenager in the sport, being able to look at these people? You know, you talk about Linda Johnson, Dave Peters, um, and all that, lot. and not just them. There's, there's so many Jason Morlands there, you know, and um, these these people are doing it week in week out, like you're doing it week in week out now. But when you were training, what was it like training with them? Uh, it's weird because, like, I think because you grew up with them, you yeah. don't see them as these like animals that they are until you start to appreciate what they're doing more. So I think it's just kind of like another, just another day of training with some people that are faster than me, and especially at that age, because there was a lot of people faster than me. It was just yeah. like, okay, this is where I am. But what that did install in me is I was always striving to be the best and be the best in the class or in the session, whatever we were doing. The only real, the biggest shock was when Connor Hancock started to come down. Right. And like do he was doing some coaching and doing things. At the time, he was the best. And he was like a celebrity of the sport, if you like. Um, so that was a shock. But then, when, again, everyone in OCR is just so normal. And like Once you start training with people and seeing people, it's, we're quite lucky because it's they're not big celebrities. Everyone's quite approachable and no one has their egos. And, yeah, so I guess it's not until now I look back and think, oh, wow, I was that young, like, training McConnor or whatever it was. And, and I think that was, that's quite cool. But at the time, it's just, these just people that I want to beat. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to beat you. You know, yeah. I'm going to beat you one day. <laughs> you just said then you weren't necessarily that fast at running. What did you do? Because, I mean, 
we've, we're talking from a young age. You can see um, 2016, 2017, you've got the ability on the rigs. You know, like I said, you got to the very last one of um, the championships, the 107 ring challenge, you know, you held that record. So you, it's quite clear that you had the upper body to take on a lot of the challenges. How did you then develop your running ability to 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 get to this level, to get to where you are now? Because you are, what was, what was your 5K time? Tell me your 5K time. Uh, my PB at the minute is 16.22. Okay, so, so, um, so that's that's very, very similar to all the top, the top athletes in OCR at this moment in time in the yeah. UK, you know, you, you're right bang on a par with, with everyone else. How did you get to that ability from, from that young age? I just, when I was younger, I just didn't like running. So I just right. neglected it. And that was the the kind of biggest change I've had to make in my training. Um, so yeah, I loved being, my favorite part of being OCR and it still is now is being on the rigs and playing like just like a kid in the playground, jumping on everything and swinging around. That's like, that's why I love OCR. And I love like OCR training sessions um, and being at Rumble. That's great because we have access to all of that. But the problem I had when I was younger was I just neglected the running. Um, Dave was obviously trying to push me to run more and do a little bit more. Also, he was quite he was quite good in a way that he just let me have fun. So rather than being this strict coach and being like, you have to do this, have to do that. It was like, no, just enjoy it. Have fun and then just see what you can do. Um, and that's kind of until I got older and I t- I probably didn't start running properly till I was about 18. And then it was like, okay, now I need to start doing a bit more running. Um, and then, yeah, then I started to run more. And I'd, I always had some speed, so I was always quite fast. Um, like even in school, I had the 800 meter record and I'd always have decent times. Even 100 meters, I was always in the top kind of four in school. Like I was I was a quick runner. I just didn't want to run. So, yeah, it wasn't until I started running more and then I started getting a bit better at it, I guess. Do you do any specialist training in the running side or do you just do you go out and do you still have fun? I mean, now you're up there with the best in, in the country. And we're going to talk about the UK OCR League in a minute and, and some of the races that you've won recently. But do you go out and do you do any specific training? Um, you know, speed work, hill work, hip, hip training, and anything like that? Yeah, so my train my training now is all structured. So everything I do is completely structured. Uh, we try and that's what's good at Rumble. And like you say, we've got good athletes, but it's because we try and take the most professional angle. Um, so we, there's no holes now because it's all, I'll be doing my 400 meter repeats or my 800 meters or hill hill reps. Um, yeah, it's, throughout the week is very kind of structured now, which sometimes isn't as fun, but now I've got other goals that kind of keep me going. So rather than thinking of this as like a, just a, th- a fun hobby, now it's more like this is what I want to do and this is what I want to be good at. So I have to kind of sacrifice and, yeah, not do as much fun just playing on rigs. And there still is a bit of that, don't get me wrong, but <laughs> not as much. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's shown this year. I mean, last year um, in, in the UK OCR series that we run in conjunction with British Obstacle Sports, uh, you, you were eighth place overall, but you only did three events, um, which, which is good. You know, I'm I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to diss that at all. That's that's a great result. Um, but we had last year we had Dan Titkin, which I guess demolished it all with with four four wins in the series. This year is not had his his own way. Nuclear Challenge Cup. You 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 pipped him to the to the post there. What was that like taking? Because Dan is, has been seen as the number one for several years in the UK, hasn't it? If we're going to yeah. be fair, and and that um, you taking him there, you know that was that's a scalp and half that isn't it. Yeah, that was just perfect game plan going perfectly kind of thing. Um, yeah, the, almost that race went, and this barely happens in OCR just because of how much we've got going on, but that race just went exactly to script pretty much. Um, I knew Tom and Dan always have the edge on the running. So I knew, of course, like nuclear, when I was looking at it, I was like, right, I'm, I'm not going to outrun them. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, so I had to stay with them on all the running sections. And then as soon as we get to the obstacles, I need to try and put a surge in. And that was basically what I tried to do. I think I got a bit fortunate that obviously Dan just had his injury as well. So he wasn't as up for it as he maybe could have been. Um, and then Tom made some mistakes on obstacles, which helped me out and put me into the race a bit more. But yeah, that was just game plan. I spoke to Dave and I spoke to Darren um, kind of before we were going into it. And I said, this is what I think I'm going to try and do. Um, and then we kind of agreed on, yeah, this is probably the way I'm going to win this thing. Um, and yeah, 
<laughs> that's what happened. There was, uh... <laughs> yeah, he got his own back at Rude Rampage. You know, yeah. Um, it, it but am I right in thinking Rude Rampage was a much more of a a running course as opposed to a obstacle? I know we had a lot of obstacles, but there was a lot of running from what I was told. I didn't go down. Yeah, it was a bit more run heavy, definitely. Um, and on a course like that, where Danny is such a good runner, it's, it's harder. It's harder to beat him, definitely. Um, I was a bit tired from the Euros as well, but then most people were in that position as well. So yeah, it was just one of them days. The finish line. We, I mean, we, we, we had such an amazing finish for second, third, and fourth between you, Jason, and oh, I'm forgot his name now. Is it Stuart? Uh, Sam. Sam, sorry, Sam, yeah. yeah. Um, Sam, I mean, I was watching it live. Thanks to Mud and Glory, I was watching it live, you know, as it happened. And we, Jason just sort of, it pipped you, but and then I saw you in the background making a little bit of a mistake going through the tyres. Am I right in saying you didn't touch yeah. the floor in the middle? Yeah, so, so I just went, jumped over them, so I had to go back, yeah. Yeah, and then Jason made the mistake on the, the van, because he used yeah. the hay bales. And you came right up next to him, and it, it looked to me like Jason just paused, and you just you just took that opportunity. But then, and then Sam was like literally so close to both of you, um, he just couldn't get past because both you and Jason was trying to get up the van at the same time, and you you just seemed to pip yeah. him. What, what an amazing end to a race! Yeah, I mean that was again one of them. We talk about Nuclear Challenge Cup going to plan. That was a ga- game plan out the window, and it was kind of like. Let's just make something happen here. Um, and luckily for me, Jason got to the van first. I think because they, we, I wasn't clear, and I'm not sure if it was briefed, but I didn't realise that you couldn't use the um, hay bales. And obviously Jason didn't either. And I think whoever got to the van first would have made that mistake. Yeah. So I think that that order, you run that race three, four or five times, that thing will happen, but just to different races every single time. Yeah, yeah, wow. Did you, did you make a conscious effort not to go to Total Warrior knowing it was going to be a running race? Or, or was it just bad timing for you? Uh, it was more, I'd raced a lot. Um, so I just kind of, I had the Spartan Sprint booked in. So I knew I was going to do that. And then when I thought about racing two days in a row, I just knew my body wouldn't have handled it well, considering we'd just raced Rude not too long ago. And then the Euros as well. So yeah. it was... It was more I wanted to get back for training for the world rather than do another race weekend, be absolutely knackered and then not be able to train. So it was more yeah. from a training standpoint to get me back on track rather than not going because of the style of race. I would have loved to go because I I needed them points. But it's, <laughs> it was more, yeah, the world, unfortunately, that's going to be my A race. And that's when you have to make them decisions. It's all right. It's all right. I mean, we, we was talking before we came on that the series this year could go right down to the very last race in terms of, we, we know that you're going to nuts. Um, I know Dan's going to nuts as well. If you can take first and Dan second at nuts, that could potentially put you on exactly the same points going into the, to the British champs. Yeah. Um, that, I'll, I, that will be, be amazing. Exciting. Yeah. yeah oh, that would really. be so, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if Dan's going to go to um, Beach Ballistic. I'm not sure what his plans are for Beach Ballistic. I know he, he um, and if anyone doesn't know about the UK series, whoever wins the series gets free entry to the following year to every race. So I know he's got a ticket, but whether he actually goes or not, I'm not sure um, if he's going up to Beach. I, I really don't want him to go, if I'm honest. <laughs> Same. <laughs> <I> want- <laughs> Um, in the nicest possible way, I want him to go to nuts and race you, and then go to the British champs. Yeah, that'd be more of a fairy tale. That would be that's the story we need. That is, yeah. um, but we'll see. We'll see what his plans are. I mean, I understand if he goes to beach as well. Um, it's it's points for him, and it's a good it's a good decision for him to go. But yeah, if he doesn't, and we go to nuts, and I if I win nuts, it's going to be all down to the British champs, which will be. That'd be really exciting. That'd be really exciting. Even if he does, even if he does go to um, Beach Ballistic and wins it, if you beat him at nuts, it's still going to go down to the final because yeah. it's your best four races. You know, so it will still go down to the British champs. Um, and the way the point system works, if you come first and him second at the British champs, you would win the series because it goes on first places on head to heads. So. Yeah, so. 
Um, yeah, it's so either way, we could we could be looking at the British champs as the as the ultimate race of the the season. I, I'm so excited. <laughs> it's amazing, All these right? Permutations. <laughs> yeah. What what one series can do is uh that's the thing about this UK series. It's I think for racing in the UK, UK OCR, it's really helped it, especially after COVID, because it's just made it so much more exciting and also got the competitive races really excited, which I think we were we were craving something like this. Yeah, yeah. And something that was easy. I mean, we, me and, when me and James discussed it and, and the rest of the team, it wasn't just me and James who came, we, we just discussed it and we wanted to make it so it was easy for people to understand rather than, you know, we, we, we couldn't have one race having more points than other. We wanted every race to be exactly the same. So everyone went to every race and, you know, or, or as many races as they could get to. Um, and it was all around the country as well because we want everyone to take part um, and do it. So yeah, it, for us it's working, and I'm glad you've just said there that yeah. competitive um, people say it's working as well. So um, absolutely, I'm, I'm super excited. Um, just going on to nuts there. Nuts is your race, as you mentioned earlier on, um, and that. What do you think to the changes they've made on the course? So I, I, I will. T- People who know me, I go to Nuts every two years. I, I, it's down south from me. I've got a long trip um, and that. So I do a pilgrimage every two years down there. I was shocked with the changes at this last, this year, compared to when I went um, two or three years ago, because I think COVID might have been a bit longer, because they've got rid of all of that, what I call the commando section. For me, was the yeah. was the most exciting part. You came out of the, the stream, up the, um, up the pipes, um, and then you went... I think it was a cargo net down to a rope through the through the crawl through the tires up the wall down the wall. It was just like the ultimate mud run section. Um, and I think now they've they've changed it a little bit. So I think it's a little bit faster course. Do you think? Do you think that? Or what's what's your thoughts? Yeah. So the course is definitely faster now. Obviously, they had they had to. I believe they had to make the changes due to rotting trees or some something to do with the trees or something like that that they had to actually yeah. cover it all up which is a shame um but what i think they've done well is now they've invested in the technical section a bit more and invested in other parts of the race so i think commando section's gone which is a shame the rest of the race i would say like technical area and some of the other parts of the race has probably improved so if they can get the commando section back i think that is the, the best all-round yeah. race you can have um but yeah, it's, there's definitely a lot of changes. I think for better or for worse, it's um, it's a di- different race to what it used to be. Yeah, if they brought that commando section, it would be the ultimate race. I'd be down there every year. I'd yeah. be down there for winter and summer, um, yeah. b- because you know it's we, we look at nu- nu- nuclear. To me, I guess is where a lot of people have got to strive to get to. You know, nuclear race has got a, has got virtually everything. Um, maybe not as technical as nuts now. I think nuts has taken over that technical side of things because to me. Nuclear used to always be more technical than nuts. Um, but now I think it's swung the other way since Mark Dixon got involved and, and did a lot of work down there and still doing work down there, you know, from what I hear. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's amazing. I think we've got to have that technical, them technical races for people like yourself to go to the Euros and go to the Worlds because we are behind in terms of the technical sections over there, aren't we? Oh, massively. And that's... The biggest divide is, um, I mean, we spoke about this on our podcast the other day, but the biggest divide at the minute in the UK is that it's all very mud run heavy or Spartan racing. That's kind of what you've got, but you haven't got any of these races that are very technical, kind of like your OCR series races or your toughest races. It's all very just jumping in and out of mud pits and running over farmers fields, which is great. And we love doing that and it's fun. But then you go to somewhere like the Euros and it's a whole different ball game because they rate the race style is just so different. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you think race directors are frightened of going too technical? Yeah. Well, that the thing is with the UK and we're always going to have a problem is the weather. The weather's just, it always creates mud because it's rainy, especially in the winter races or the, mm. the more kind of autumn races, it's a bit more rainy, a bit more sloppy. The actual ground we have to use is always a bit more clayey and a bit more, or, or flat because we don't have access to mountains or hills as much. Um, so I think we are, it's hard to make a technical race because Nuts tried it, uh, sorry, not Nuts, Nuclear tried it for the Challenge Cup um, and they made a really good technical race, but then they get a load of complaints because it was raining and there was a bit of mud. So it made yeah. 
the obstacle placement really important. Um, I think it's doable. You just have to place the obstacles well, which I think is just going to be a bit of a sticking point for a lot of RDs because they're going to have to try and manoeuvre their races or manoeuvre where they go or the access they've got, um, which is quite hard to do, obviously. I mean, you touched on nuclear, making it technical. Um, I think you was one of only about five or six people who, who ran competitive that made it through that that rig, um, the low rig where you were literally, you, you, your knees were nearly touching your chest as you was going through, weren't you? Yeah. Um, you know, when you got to that, did, did you realise how tough it was? Because, I mean, it was tough. Every, everyone, like I said, so many people struggled. But even you at one stage, I thought you was very, very close to to coming off and you've got the upper body strength. Did, did you realise when you looked at how tough it was going to be? Yeah, so the actual, I think the actual rig itself on a different day where it's a bit drier would be a lot more doable. It was still a hard low rig, but it's, I'd say, just as hard as some of the rigs you do see in Europe. And I think yeah. that's kind of the route they went down. Um, whoever designed the race, I think they were looking at more European races and seeing what they were doing and seeing what they can get away with, which was great. And for the people that were strong enough, it was great. But the problem is, is because you've just come off the back of the water and then you just went through loads of obstacles that were very similar movements. You were, one, tired, but also, two, caked in mud and wet when you got there. So I think that made it harder. And then the actual rig itself, like I say, would, would be doable for most people. I know, like, I coach at Rumble and we'd get people on a similar rig going through it, no problem, but just because of the environment's a bit different. Yeah. As soon as you add a little bit of water, cause a little bit of rain and a little bit of mud and come off the death slide, it just kind of changes it a little bit. And it was more the placement, I think, that made it hard rather than the obstacle itself. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to, I don't know if you do this, I, I used to pride myself a little bit. I'd, I'd never failed a rig, I think, up until about 2021, 2022, um, when I used to race a little bit. But I used to go out and literally I would run um 10 miles and then i would go and play in the rig in the garden so i was actually my body was tired and you know and when i used to go when i used to live in the middle of the countryside i would actually be able to climb walls farmers walls and things like that so i was mimicking an ocr race but then i would come back and do the rigs and i felt that was that helped me so much when i actually got to a race and it was the middle of a race um that yeah i'd done it tired so i knew that i knew i could do them i, I really struggle on the ones now because they've they've developed that much and i'm I'm much older and much heavier. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, do, do you do that? Do you go out and, and run and then do it? Or do you, do you just train the rigs when you go to Rumble? Uh, yeah, so I've got a rig in my garden, which uh, I'll play on. And I'm working from home at the minute as well a little bit more. So I'll try and sneak down there on breaks and just do some grip training. Uh, but a lot of, so like I say, my, a lot of my training is quite specific. Um, so I'll have programmed in days where, it might be like a racing day. So it'll be kind of anywhere between 800 to a mile running. Then you'll do a few obstacles, then you'll run again and you'll do something quite similar to a race. Yeah. Um, or we'll do sessions. So tomorrow, for example, I'm going down to Rumble with Darren uh, Martin. and um, It's going to be just two hours of running and playing. Um, really easy, but just getting a feel for the obstacles whilst your heart rate's a little bit higher, but not so high where it's you can't think still. Um, so it's a mixture of the both run and do obstacles just do obstacles kind of all always on obstacles <laughs> always on obstacles <laughs> but that's that's what we're doing and um, well so we've got to talk about darren there and let's talk about darren and chris and um accountability corner first of all the name where, where, where did accountability corner podcast name actually come from i know it's about accountability but it just doesn't shout ocr to me and, and i'm just being honest when i say this it didn't shout ocr so what was in the name so that's exactly it it didn't scream ocr um we kind of we didn't want to pigeonhole ourselves in one niche where it was just all ocr we wanted to be somewhere where all kind of athletes can go whether you're a triathlete whether you're just a runner any kind of endurance sport really can can listen to our podcast and take something away from it um so when we were thinking of names it was we did think of kind of um accountability ocr or ocr races or different things like that but we kind of wanted to steer clear just so we have a bit more accessible accessibility shall we say um yeah. to a wider audience um and we d we don't feel like we just have to always cater to the ocr scene but no, I, I, that's that's a great way of doing it. 
Who comes up with the um, the topics? Uh, Chris is mainly our topic guy. <laughs> Although he'll he'll kill me for telling you because he he likes to keep this image that he's not prepared and he doesn't do anything. Um, but he's he's really good at thinking of him and Darren to be fair. I, to be honest, I just sit in the corner and let them discuss, and then I edit it afterwards. <laughs> That's kind of my role. I'm just there for the youth to bring the marriage countdown. <laughs> You're just there because you're the best racer of them all. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They've got yeah, to have I mean, some really are... famous on it. <laughs> yeah. I um I saw this week that you've been on your Instagram the the pictures you've been putting up are very much top Trump pictures, um, which I quite like. I've got to tell me I do I do quite like them. Um, but you know I mean you you they put you at ninety four, Chris at ninety two, and and Darren at ninety three. Who came up with the scores for this? Oh, it was completely me. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, yeah, it was just, that was a, a little bit of free moment away from my computer at work. I thought, well, maybe I can just make something. Because we talked about statistics in our last podcast and yeah. like grading systems. And we talked about top trumps a little bit as well. So I thought it'd be quite a fun little post to do. Um, but yeah, that's why I'm def- I'm the highest because I was like, uh, I can't have them under me. That hurt my ego too much. I just thought it was, it was when it came up on my um, Instagram, I was like loving it. I'm thinking, yeah, I've said this before. I can't remember I was talking to about it, but I was saying we should really actually have top trumps for OCR. You know, it would be amazing if we if we could get that. I, I think there'd be too many people upset, though, with with scores, you know, that on there, wouldn't they? But um, yeah, so it's all opinion, isn't it, at the end of the day? You love it. Even that, in our group chat afterwards, once I made him, Chris was not happy that he was at the bottom. He was... <laughs> He was trying to. He was arguing his case and telling us what he what he thought. And uh, yeah, you'll never keep anyone happy. No. <laughs> you, you would always be someone who would who would complain and say, "I'm a I'm better than that at whatever whatever score you gave them and and things like that." <laughs> so, so you see, you you do all the editing and and that and everything else. Um, is that part of your day job? And I mean, I know your day job, but our our listeners don't. Uh, yeah. So I've kind of. I'm in a weird transitioning phase, really. Uh, so I, I am a PT. So I've been a PT since I was, well, passing when I was 18. But I've worked at Rumble. Dave had me on board kind of when I was 16. Um, so I've always been in the fitness industry. But this year, because I wanted more weekends to myself to race, um, I started working for my mate's company. So I've been doing all the social media and video editing for him. Um, I did like video editing and media in school. So it was always kind of another skill that I had. Uh, but yeah, just decided to get a bit more of a sit down desk job just so I can work kind of in the week more and not have to work always on the weekends. Yeah, yeah, I get that. And, and I've gone going back a little bit now. Let, uh, talk about video editing and that. I was looking earlier on at a video of you um, on your YouTube channel, calories versus EV wearing. What am I? <laughs> who come up with this uh, this challenge idea of calories between you and EV wearing? Love the video, by the way. Um, but yeah, what what was that all about? Uh, that was so in lockdown. Um, I started my YouTube channel and started posting a bit more just because I had loads of free time and I just needed to fill it with something. Um, but Evie started doing the same thing. Uh, so we jumped on a few kind of Zoom calls and um, and just had chats really about social media, YouTube, and things going on. And then we just we thought it'd be really fun to do like a video together. Obviously, because it was lockdown as well, you can't meet up, you can't do anything. So it was like, how do we do this? Um, so yeah, together we just came up with, let's do a calorie barrel. Um, I'll eat, she'll train, because we thought that was the fairest way to do it at the time. Um, and yeah, and then, and then that video was born. I, I love it how you, you go, I'm going to go and cook breakfast now. And then you turn around and say, yeah, I've cooked burgers, because I went to the freezer and they were going to be out of date, so I, I cooked some of my <laughs> That's the that's the most random thing that any any fella who lives on their own, that's what we would do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's uh, in the fridge? Oh burgers, yeah, it's breakfast at 12 o'clock. That's what I'm having. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly it. That was uh <laughs> just whatever I can find, get the calories in, and then yeah, go from there. <laughs> <laughs> who won it? Uh I won by quite a bit. So was... Evie made a, an apology because I know the, the forfeit was an apology, a tongue-in-cheek apology on her Instagram. Yeah, yeah. So Evie had to do that. Um, it was kind of, we did talk about doing it the other way around as well because it was, I think it was kind of always I was going to win because it's just a lot harder for her to burn calories than well, anyone really than to eat calories. Um, especially me, I can eat a lot. So I 
Eve is not a, not really a big person, is it? So she's, I mean, her burning calories, she's gonna she's gonna virtually disappear, I think, and I mean that in the nicest possible yeah. way. Um, she's a very fit person with very little little fat on her, so her burning calories is um, pretty tough. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were FaceTiming throughout the day, and she wasn't telling me the calories she was on, but she was telling me what she was doing. And some of the stuff she was doing, I was like, wow, she's training a lot. Like she's she's going to be burning a lot. But then when we got to the end and we actually discovered, I was like, wow, if I did the, the exercise she did, I would have burned so much more just from being a yeah. bit of a bigger frame. Um, yeah. But yeah, but I won and I didn't have to apologise. That was the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great video. I, I was like, so I, I was laughing. I was watching it. I was thinking, yeah, this is this is pretty good. This is pretty good. Um. Touch on what earlier on this year you went down to Mike's gym in April. Is that right? Yeah. What was Mike's gym like? It's a place that I haven't been to, and I keep saying I want to go and and try it out. They've got the monkey bars over the pool and things like that, and it just it looks so much fun. Um, to do oh, it. it's it's incredible. I've uh, been there. I think this is second time or third, second or third time I've been there. But this like every time you go, it's just piercing. Yeah, it's it is like the seven wonders of the world, but for OCR. I think if you're into OCR, this is it's the place to go. It's uh, you have you have to go there at least once, especially if you're on in Europe because it's it's just a different the environment. As soon as you get there, you've got people training around you. Everyone's working hard, and then you've got like the the iconic rig over the pool, um, the actual obstacle course, which is really fun. And people you don't see much of the actual course on Instagram, but the course in itself is like insane it's like all these switchbacks up and down this hill and you have to use a rope to climb over these boulders and it's just yeah it's, I, I would if i could afford it i'd be out there for months because it's just it's it's incredible <laughs> oh amazing sounds cool seven wonders of ocr i like that what would you put in it oh uh that's I'll a... pick any obstacles or races I, I i've got a couple that i would probably put in i would put tough guy in purely because yeah. it was the original um, it's got to be got to be in there. Obstacle wise, I might put um, Bridge of Despair in at Ram Run, but the yes. one I would put in because to me I've loved it since it was ever built was down at Nuts, the tire crawl up the chimney. So because that to me, when Wayne built that, was in nothing. We'd never seen anything at all like that at all. It was like I remember going down there and being one of the first people to go up it on a training session and thinking, oh my god, this is absolutely amazing. Not yeah. not hard, not difficult, but amazing. It's just that little bit of creativity as well that yeah, it was probably needed at the time. Um, yeah, put that in. Put just nuts to the hole. We've got four now. We've got four now. <laughs> we need three more. Your turn. Come on, Mark. Three more. Uh, so we so we've included Mike's gym, haven't we? Um, yeah. well, I'd probably say you have to put some form of championship event in. So either like the European champs or world champs or or maybe we just bracket championships as a whole. Experience <laughs> a championship. Um, <laughs> maybe so the, the first ever world championships, because that was like the first one where it got everyone in the world together, wasn't it? So the, um, was it at Blue Mountain somewhere in um, over in America? Uh, probably. Was, I think I was probably a bit young when the first one happened. But yeah, um, yeah it, was, uh, it wasn't the first. Oh, I don't know. I've... I can't think. I've, no, no, I, 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 had, I can I can picture it on my head, but um, it was uh, it was quite. Was it sandy? I remember it because I, I think there was one before the mountain one, which right. was like quite a smaller one, but and it was more of a flatter course. I might be I might be butchering this. I might get it all wrong. But <laughs> I, I, you just remind me though. I've got another one that could go in there. The Kit Bricks Wall when everyone went out to the worlds and took the kit bricks in the airport and took the picture. Made a massive, that? yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that on social media, yeah. That's one for consideration. We've got two more. We'll put that to the listeners, eh? So you've yeah. got to fetch this up on accountability card and I'll <laughs> fetch you up on the Swift Art um, and we'll put that to the listeners. What are your seven... Um, I can see what we come up with. Yeah, seven seven OCR wonders of the world and see see what people come up with. I think that's a great topic for this. <laughs> to, that could be a podcast in itself. Yeah. <laughs> Breaking oh, down. That would, that would be. <laughs> There's a swift half idea you got there. <laughs> I love it. I love it. What, what's what's next? We talked about earlier on, um, you've got the UK OCR series and, and that we've got the world champs coming up in Belgium, is it? Yeah. In yeah, Belgium. Belgium in September, yeah. What's, what's the plans there? What's... 
Uh, so yeah, that's so kind of for me for the rest of the year. That's my A race. That's the one I'm really all my training's geared towards that and the British champs. Um, I mean, I'm running the three k and the twelve k in the elite. Um, so that is where I'm kind of. Well, I think it's fifteen k at the worlds, but that's where I'm putting all my training into, especially the three k. Um, the goal is to try and get top ten in the three k. Um, yeah. And then 15K is top 10 as well, but that's going to be a harder task for me, I think, where my fitness is at at the minute. Uh, so, yeah, I think 3K especially, that's where I'm kind of really training towards and gearing up to. Who, who do you see your your biggest rivals there on the 3K course? Do you know what? The world is going to be so everyone because it's just so stacked. Um, from Especially the European like guys that are going, there's just so many good competition um, even like at the, when we was out at the Euros, you could run that race 20 times. And I think your top three for that race would be the same. But I think top back from the top three, that would change so many times just because it's such so stacked. And everyone on their day can put in such a good performance. Um, but yeah, it's going to be it's going to be interesting. It's going to be nice Very to so. run hard and try and get in that top 10. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you see... Do you, do you think? Well, I'm going to I'm going to assume you're going to think this because you're very confident that you're going to be the top the top the UK guy in that three K. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I believe I will be. Obviously, we'll see when we're out there. But yeah, <laughs> and we, you know we just talked then about the running elite against A group. I think it's great that you're running elite. You know, you are the best um, in the UK, or you're right up there with the best in the UK at this moment in time. Um, so I think it's great that you're really elite at this high level and not stepping back, which is what you talked about on Accountability Corner not long since. Um, and I love that topic about if you're good enough to run elite, then run, run elite. And I don't know if you know, but this last weekend, um, Liam Mitchell stepped up to elite in, at Spartan in um, yeah, I saw, yeah. USA and podiumed. Um, yeah. So hopefully we might see him. Now he's got the confidence to to start racing elite in the UK because I think he should do. Yeah, hundred percent. Looking at especially on a Spartan course, um, I'm not sure, as sure what he's like on like a more technical OCR course, but I know he's a really good kind of Spartan obstacle racer. Um, yeah. So yeah, the more the more people in the elite, the better. Uh, the more competition there is to try and beat, uh, that just that's what excites me. That's what lights me up. I want to compete against the best. Um, you don't want to turn up to races and win by ten minutes and no one be there. I'd rather turn up to a race, re- have a real good battle and win. Um, so yeah, I welcome anyone into the elite if they're especially like him who's quick enough. He's definitely quick enough. Yeah, very much so. Do, do you have a, a long-term plan? So you know you talked about your structure of racing. Do you have a long-term plan to get to to the top in, in Europe and the world? You know, you're up there in the UK. You're only 22. You you, you know, you're, you're right. You're a youngster, really. Um, and that, you know, people don't really start to peak until the, the mid to late 20s in terms of, you know, running and things like that. We see the best of them at that age. Do you have that long term plan to get there? And and how do you how do you think you're going to have to get there? Yeah. So for me, I'm always looking up. So I'm always looking at the best in the world and thinking that's where I want to be. And that's who I want to be racing against. Um, I love racing in the UK and I haven't conquered the UK yet. So that's kind of step one, if you like, is trying to be the best consistently in the UK um, and then winning the British champs this year will be a good point in the right direction um, and then yeah it's just looking up trying to crack into that kind of top 10 top five podiums in Europe um, and then from Europe start to look at really getting into the world and being as best as I can be in the world at this sport yeah the um the, the, we talk about in the same breath as John Alban and, and yeah. Conor Hancock <laughs> we're very close to that at this moment in time <laughs> So, yeah. um, you know, people now, do, do you do you realise how people look up to you at this age? It's such a, you're at such a young age. Do you, do you see people at Rumble Fitness looking up to you, potentially like you looked up to Connor? Not really. I always have a bit of a chip on my shoulder and think I'm a bit of, nobody knows who I am still and that I'm trying to prove to everyone that I am the best. Um, so I think that's just my mindset, really. Maybe it's an age thing, but it's just, I always think, oh no, no one really knows who I am and everyone's like, oh, who's this young ginger kid that talks a lot of rubbish and says he's <laughs> going to be the best? Um, and I want to prove to everyone that, no, I will be the best. But um, yeah, but I did have, so we do a lot of junior training and there was some parents actually the other day said some really nice things about how their kids were looking up to me. And and that was, it was the first time where 
I had to put on this hat of, oh, okay, oh, I am a bit of a figure, if you like, for, for yeah. the youth, um, which normally I just think, yeah, no, just no one cares. It's, it's just this mouthy little ginger runner. <laughs> I like that. Uh, and you're definitely not a mouthful of ginger ale, no. <laughs> you're definitely not, no. Um, a <laughs> couple of quick fire questions for you before we go. Running shoes, what do we use? Because I'm very technical-minded about running shoes. What are we currently running in and racing in? Uh, the Adidas um, Terex Speed Pros, I think they're called, or, or Speeds, whatever. That, yeah, the Adidas is what I'm loving at the minute. For OCR, that is. Yeah. And then, look, look, how big are grips on that? Because they don't look very big grips when I've looked at that. But I know Becky's told me that they're quite good as well. Well, they're really weird because they're, they're only four mil lugs on the non-soft ground versions. Yeah. Um, and that's what I tend to normally race. And they do do a soft ground version, which has a bigger lug on. So that's a bit grippier. But it just grips really well. Like even the four mils, I ran, well, Nuclear was a good example. I ran them in that and I wasn't really slipping and sliding. There was a few slips and slides, but... Everyone does it um, nuclear yeah. just because it's so muddy. Um, so, yeah, I just I haven't found a shoe like them for OCR yet. I've, I have liked VEJs, but not all of the VEJs work for my feet. Um, and the Terex just seem to, they're just like moulded for my feet. It feels like I've just, yeah, they're just really comfortable, but really light. So they still feel fast. And the grip is surprisingly really good. Um, it's not the best grip. Like VEJs is the best grip. Yeah. But but it's not that far behind. So you, I kind of sacrificed that for the comfort um, and how it kind of feels on my, to run in. Yeah, that's cool. And what do you do a training a different brand or is it on Adidas for training as well? Uh, no, so I only race in Adidas and that's the only Adidas shoe I really use. Um, run, like training wise, a lot of times I'll be, if I'm on the trails and it's more easy, I'll be on speed goats. They're kind of my go-to more easier or more training based shoe um if i'm on the roads i've got loads of road shoes i'm a bit of a shoe collector to be honest <laughs> i'll be in Sockenies one week i'll be in a pair of nikes the next training session just yeah i'm always trying and testing do you try and get even if you go different brands do you go with shoes that have the same drop on or do you do you mix and match because I, I mean i don't know that it has compared to the speed goats but i i'm i Never ever looked at drops up until quite recently, and now I'm trying to run in the same drop shoes, even if they're different brands. No, um, I kind of it depends on my training sessions, so right. I kind of link the drops that I'm using typically with the training sessions I'm doing. Um, more just because I use a similar sort of shoe for the training sessions, so that's kind of what happens. But there's no, yeah, I'll be anywhere from a four mil drop to a I've got 12 mil drop shoes. Like it's really varied in terms of drop wow. and support. Wow. Do you know, because I'm, I'm always trying to avoid injuries. I mean, like I was saying, you a bit younger than me, but do they not, you did, do your feet not know the difference in terms of, so if I went to a 12 mil, you know, um, a 12 mil drop, I would, I would probably be really struggling. Uh, I'm very much like a, a, a zero, two, two or four at the moment. Um, I've had some problems with shoes. Yeah, definitely on the higher end. So I'm definitely, I prefer a more low drop shoe. Um, when I say 12 mil, I don't have many of them and that's a very rare occasion. But uh, I think typically eight is probably the highest I'll go. Uh, but I, I don't know if it's because I just wear so many shoes. Like every day I'll be training in a different pair of shoes, typically, or at least every other day. So maybe because I'm changing up so much, my feet don't get used to just the same drop and they're quite used to being a bit more flexible and varied. Maybe, I, and my feet might just get away with it a bit more as well um but yeah i don't i haven't had too many problems what about what about socks certain brands of socks or same ones uh, or different yeah so i wear the same socks and it's the brave i think it's called brave um yeah i, I found them and I've, i'm in love i love a an odd like a weird looking sock or an odd sock or a sock with funky things on so a lot of times when you see me in the race course i'll have like monkeys on my socks or um walruses or watermelons i've got yeah um, oh, I like it. So I've always got a, it's kind of, uh, everyone takes piss out of me normally for it because I'll, I'll always have something weird on or something wacky. Uh, but it's because the brand I use as well, they're, most of their socks are weird and wacky. So yeah. it's kind of, that's what started it because I like the sock. And now it's just become a thing where it's kind of what I do, I guess. <laughs> I like that. I like that. And, and you're not, I know you're not like um, Chris Shipley and you don't wear bright coloured shorts, but do we have a, a certain brand of shorts or is it just, something you pick up off the shelf 
Uh, I have, yeah, again, it's just very, very, I have a lot of Adidas, but I think that's just because there was a big Adidas sale on not too long ago and I just got loads of clothes. Uh, but yeah, I'll run in it. I'm not too like brand specific. I'll kind of, if it's comfy, I'll wear it. If it's not comfy, I won't wear it kind of thing. So what we need is when um, the Adidas salespeople listen to this podcast, they need to contact you with some type of sponsorship if you're going to be advertising their goods, don't we? That's what we need. Yeah, 100%. I'll be, I'll be well up for that. <laughs> I, I only wear Adidas for everything. Everything. <laughs> and you need to start making socks, Adidas, with walruses on and water. <laughs> yes, I'll have my own sock line. Yeah. And then obviously the Rumble Fitness will put three straps down the side of it, eh? Yeah, there you go. See? <laughs> Advertising <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Completely certain. <laughs> have you got any um, sponsorships at this moment in time, Mo? Because I mean, you talk about it, you're right up there. Um, we know a few people in the in the sport have. Has, have you reached out to anyone? Has anyone reached out to you? Uh, no. Um, I've reached out to people. I've been rejected a few times. Uh, but I, I, I want to, if I get a, something sponsoring me, obviously I want to make sure I'm using it. I've had a few, like, People, I'm not going to name names, but approach me of products that I wouldn't really use. Yeah. Uh, so kind of turn them away. But anything I'll use, oh, yeah. If, if a sponsorship comes, don't get me wrong, I'm well up for it. But nothing at the minute. It's just kind of paying that's, for all my stuff. And I think that's the way to be. I think you've got to use it. We're very much like that at, uh, here at UKOCR. So we have a few brands that help us and support us. And we tend to do it as a partnership. So we will only promote products that we actually use and we think the value for money. Um, there's nothing worse than... We won't sell a soul, shall I say. That's probably the yeah. easiest thing. Don't sell your soul. It's people realise when you're only in it for the money. And um, I think people know we're not in it for the money here at UK. So yeah. <laughs> I know you guys are not either. Um, before I let you go, because we, we, I think this has absolutely flown. I have got more notes on here um, that we haven't talked about. Um, winning OCR games, um, things like that. Um yeah, we didn't. I could talk about lots of other things, but before I let you go and we'll wrap up, um, is anyone you want to give a shout out to? Anything else you want to add? Uh, no, not really. Um, obviously, we've talked a lot about Rumble today. Uh, so if you want any OCR coaching, I am a coach of Rumble as well. So from me or Dave or uh, come down, check us out, and run some mobs, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's it, really. <laughs> And you've got to listen to Accountability Corner if you haven't listened to Oh, that yeah, you yeah they're going to kill me for that. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a big shout-out to do. Um, yeah, so we, me, Chris Shipley and Darren Martin, who we've talked about today as well, uh, we do have our own podcast, Accountability Corner. So if you want to check that out, uh, feel free. Uh, it's a lot more kind of sports-specific, if you like, um, but we do talk a lot of crap as well. So if you like that, uh, head over. I, I, I love it. I love listening to it because you just don't talk the OCR all the time or sport all the time. You do have a conversation, which I think is really, really good. And it, you tailor it to your experience as well, which I, I appreciate when I listen to it, that, you know, it's not just someone giving an opinion. It's like we're giving this opinion because this is how we've experienced it and, and seen it and done it, which I always think is a really good um, podcast when people can do that. Yeah, we're trying to come at it from, like I say, a more athlete-based angle. Uh, because we're all mainly because we're all in the sport and we're all athletes and we're all competing. Uh, we do. We also try and look at it from all the other views. But I think the good thing is we have is me, Darren, and Chris. All are very different in how we race, train, and prepare. So we all have very different angles. So it gives it a nice balance of we're not just all saying the same thing and agreeing with each other. We actually discuss and disagree probably more of the time than agree. So it works nicely. Well. Mo, thank you very much for joining me. It has been a pleasure chatting to you. Yeah, same. Thank you for having me on. So a big thank out there to Morgan for joining me. A big thank out to all our patrons as well for supporting us. Big thank you to you guys and girls for listening to us. Um, it is important that we do get listeners and we have quite a lot at the moment. What we haven't had, and I know we've got quite a few new listeners, what we haven't had for a while is we haven't had a review. So if you've not left us a review... Pop on to your favourite channel, whether you listen through Spotify, Apple, Deezer, whatever it would be. Just pop on and leave us a little review. Um, give us a few stars. As many stars as you think we deserve. Um, but it, it helps us. It helps us get our podcast out there. It helps OCR because we're one of the few people in the UK that are doing OCR podcasts. So it does help OCR because it gets us the brand out there or the OCR brand out there and 
gets people hopefully to listen to us and maybe take it up. Um, and that's the ultimate aim of what we're trying to do. Uh, if you want to know more about the UK OCR series, head over to um, UKOCR.com or head over to British Obstacle Sports and we post regular on there about it. What's coming up next, we've got um, on the UKR series, we've got Beach Ballistic, which reminds me that next Monday you will get Will and Cole back. So Will, Chris and Becky will be back to talk about Beach Ballistic and then we're going to the final two race of the season, Nuts 1K, 7K Sprint, which is going to be absolutely amazing, followed by the the British Obstacle Sports Championship, so the British Championship race. Um, exciting times, exciting times. Anyway, guys and girls, I am going to shoot because I am going to go to work. I hope all you have a great day. I hope you have a, um, whatever you've got planned. Um, enjoy it, smile, whatever it is, and you take care, and we'll speak soon. I love you all. Bye.